My friends, Ukraine did not accept the L they took in Bakhmut against the PMC. So they're actively working to get the city back. This was the situation on June 1st. And this is how much ground they gained in about two months. If we push the ruler really deep, we get approximately 4.5 inches gained. I mean, kilometers gained, yeah. They can't liberate the city directly because Wagner left Bieber and Dolik to cover the west side of Bakhmut. So in order to avoid them, Ukrainian assault squads focus their attention on clearing the Siversky Donetsk canal. As you can see, Ukrainian forces are rapidly progressing south of Bakhmut, and they're now facing Klitschivka, Andreevka, and Kordumivka. Apart from that, the Ukrainian army is also launching attacks towards Berhivka and Yahidne hoping to get Bakhmut into a pincer, essentially undoing all the work done by the Wagner PMC. In the end, the capture of these two settlements could force the Russians to abandon this entire salient north of Bakhmut and fall back behind the Bakhmutka River, which would then turn Saledar into an even bigger objective for Ukraine. This front is under command of Ukrainian general Sirsky, a very strong military commander credited with the defense of the capital, Kyiv, and for the Kharkiv offensive of September 2022. Yet, recently he came up with very strange statements, such as, so far things are developing according to plans that were drawn up and approved. Right. Hello, deputy commander, I have plan. We lose 30% of European vehicles in two months for one or two kilometers of potato fields. Or claiming that Russian forces in Bakhmut have been semi-encircled. I mean, that's a stretch. Only if Ukraine reaches the Zaitsevi Kadema line, then we can start talking about a semi-encirclement. Or maybe he's just foreshadowing something that could happen in months time. Like what some insufferable YouTuber did back in November. Truth be told, it's just a matter of time before Ukrainian assault units will force the Russians out of Klishivka. Oh, by the way, little flash update from the Luhansk front. Ukraine did the right thing and quickly counterattacked the Russian bridgehead over the Zherebyets river by retaking the village of Novoyerhovka, which more or less segments the bridgehead in two. Ideally, they should push the Russians back to the river ASAP. Because just like the Soviets did during World War II, the Russians will establish a lot, dozens of little bridgeheads. And if they're not dealt with quickly enough, the defender will just get overwhelmed. Now, the reason why the Ukrainian armed forces are restarting the battle for Bakhmut is relatively simple. They had accumulated a lot of reserves during the spring that were just sitting around, and it was time to get their hands to work. The same way you gotta get your money's worth on that hub premium membership. And from a political perspective, presenting the capture of at least part of Bakhmut will significantly boost Ukrainian morale after months of setbacks. Some of Ukraine's specialized offensive brigades are concentrated south of Bakhmut, like the 3rd Assault Brigade, Azov, and the 5th Assault Brigade, beefed up with the elite 24th Separate Assault Battalion, Aidar, and more recently with the new Assault Brigade, Lyut which means rage or fury in Ukrainian, composed of six battalions of the special forces of the police. This also confirms what I said in a previous video, where Ukraine was looking to draft thousands of police officers. Ukraine needs troops so badly. It is said that Ukraine wants to draft 1,000 police officers from every region of Ukraine and expects to field roughly 20,000 of them for combat operations. And now we know where they went. And these police special forces even have their own anthem called Lyut from a band called Cossack System. Cause, let's be honest, the song Fortress Bahmut is not up to date anymore. Anyway, I hope the band will appreciate this little shout out. Now back to the front and I present you this brand new FPS called Call of Duty Saving Private Osman. He's a member of the 24th Battalion Aidar. We see him running through the trenches, sees his buddy, and then he gets hit in the hand. So he simply runs back, 
crosses path with a couple soldiers until one places a tourniquet on him. In the end, we got an update from Private Osman and he's fine at the hospital. Facing these ideologically motivated assault units, Russia had the brilliant idea to position depleted and weakened units, like the 72nd Mortalized Rifle Brigade that failed to capture Vahledar and the 4th Separate Brigade of the LPR. This unit suffered a lot from the continuous Ukrainian attacks. There are many reports from soldiers of this brigade complaining about fatigue and how they have not been rotated out in two months. We don't know exactly what happened, but some rumors claim that while trying to rally his men, a commander named Bogachenko was KIA leading the ghost battalion he had founded as part of the 4th Brigade of the LPR. From a tactical perspective, not only is Ukraine attacking a sector with tired units, but it's also a sector notorious for its lack of minefields and Russian defenses. In this video, you can see Ukrainian sappers of the 28th Mechanized Brigade using some mine clearing line charge, possibly the M58 mine click over roughly 100 meters. And here's the Seversky Donetsk Canal and the subsequent detonation. They kept going until they opened a wide passage, after which three BMPs rushed right into the area that was cleared. They released some smokescreen and infantry disembarked while being covered by the suppressive fire of the BMPs, after which they ended up securing this entire side of the canal. As you can see on the map, this event was geolocated right here on the map on June 25th, where they cleared the entire west side of the canal in preparation of an attack against Andreevka and Kordyumivka. In this video, you can see some Ukraine soldiers quickly exiting from an MRAP. They enter some trench networks and they're welcomed by some CO. We understand that this is the furthest point of advance from where they will prepare to assault Russian positions. In this frame, seven Ukrainians of the same 3rd Assault Brigade Azov face one lone Russian, covering the retreat for his seven comrades. This is taking place right here on the map, along the canal. Not far away from the mine clearing line charge I showed you earlier, the Ukrainian squad is closely tailing the Russian defenders. Surprisingly, the odds are even, 7 v 7. The situation is chaotic and the trenches quickly turn into a deadly maze. Here two lost Russians run straight towards the Ukrainians. These two here are more lucky, as they surrender to eight of their enemies. The platoon stronghold is quickly stormed as more Russians raise their hands and the few survivors flee. And here's a rare look into the aftermath of such an assault. We just see members of a squad chilling in enemy trenches, grouped up, happy to be alive, and waiting to be rotated out. Same thing here, these guys are just passing each other a bottle of water. This guy is vaping, smoking is bad. And the other soldiers at the back are replenishing on ammunition. Although most of these videos showcase Ukrainian victories, it's only a glimpse of the reality. Because as you know, the toll for such attacks is high. Here the Russians wait for this BTR-4E to drop off all the troops when the positions get entirely hammered from all sides. And here we can see some wounded Ukrainians quickly brought back to the rear. But this is when having elite and ideologically motivated troops is super important because they keep pushing no matter the cost. And this is what you want in such offensive. Like that, the Ukrainians cleared all Russian strongholds along the canal. And this allowed them to expand their breachhead, namely along this tree line, which they would use as springboard to take hold of the strategic fort overlooking Klitschivka. This is when the Russians urgently sent the 83rd Separate Guards Air Assault Brigade as reinforcements to hold the crumbling front. Welcome to History Legends and here are the latest news of the Russo-Ukrainian War. If you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. As you know, some of my Ukraine videos have been targeted with limited or no ads. So make sure to check out my Patreon or PayPal to keep the show running. Thank you to everyone that has already helped and welcome to the headquarters. You can only carry on the offensive if all enemy strongholds left behind have been cleared. Otherwise, you'll have a hard time and bad surprises while bringing reinforcements. This is where the infamous third wave comes in. In this video, you can see a Ukrainian assault team exiting from a BMP. However, notice their equipment and how it's made for trench clearing. In this frame alone, you can see three Yugoslav M80 Zolia main portable anti-tank weapons. One Ukrainian soldier carries two of them. And here you can see a Ukrainian soldier holding a modernized PKM machine gun. 
all this firepower for only four guys. Then you can see how Ukrainian stormtroopers are essentially using the same trench clearing tactics as soldiers during World War I 100 years ago. Just like Jason Love, they stick it in every hole they see. One grenade to the left, you lobe another one there, and another one to the right. And here's a precise example. This Ukrainian sits at a corner before the entry of a dugout and immediately throws a grenade in it. A moment later, this other soldier also does the same thing to a position a bit further away. This Ukrainian assault team is talking to the Russians in front of them, telling them to surrender, but the Russians don't want. So check out this very exclusive footage from inside a Ukrainian HQ regarding stubborn enemy units. So here's what they do. They send tanks to suppress strongholds that won't give up. And if the enemy is proving difficult, they actually send two Ukrainian tanks right in front of enemy entrenchments to fire at point blank. And here's also a side benefit of using tanks. In the end, we see eight Russian paratroopers of the 83rd Airborne Brigade raising their hands and moving towards enemy lines. One argument that the Ukrainians often use to get the enemy to surrender is that they'll be exchanged in a couple of weeks anyway. And this also confirms the presence of the Russian 83rd Airborne Brigade. Despite Russia's greatest efforts to hold the line, by the 5th of July, only the fort remained in Russian hands. On top of that, Ukrainian DRGs were reported to have infiltrated into Klitschivka. Here's drone footage of the forest from where the Ukrainians got a foothold into the western part of the village of Klitschivka, which we can confirm with this Russian shelling of their own village. In response to some panic that spread over Russian Telegram claiming that the Russians had abandoned the village, a lot of videos were released confirming Russia's control on Klitschivka. There was also this Russian report that said that the Ukrainians could advance so much because they had unlimited reserves. Like in many parts of the front, the hardest is to hold the recently captured positions, something that is often delegated to conscripts and mobilized personnel. Their job is to dig in and hold the ground. One such unit is the 419th Rifle Battalion from Western Ukraine. We know this because of this video recorded by the 4th Brigade of the LPR with some captured Ukrainian soldiers. What's interesting is that this battalion was created in late March 2023, entirely composed of mobilized personnel from the region of Ivano-Frankivsk. Just like what we learned from the video, they're essentially called forward whenever Ukraine needs men to fill the gaps. Here you can see 10 days in the life of a Ukrainian Mobik near Klitschivka, from his arrival to the front, to his first firefight with the enemy, going through a Russian artillery barrage, bringing some casualties to the rear, and of him ending up in the hospital. Another unit like that is the 22nd Mechanized Brigade. However, a problem I notice is that often these units lack overall awareness of what's happening on the battlefield. They often ignore camouflage procedure and the lethality of drones. Like in this video where a small group of Ukrainians is occupying some dugouts inside a tree line when the exact position they were in gets shelled by the Russians. And just during the Great War, here you can see a Ukrainian soldier buried after a shell landed near him, with his comrades actively working to get him out. Once again, Russian artillerymen are stalking Ukrainian troops that just settled in in some trenches southwest of Bakhmut. In this video, the aftermath of an artillery strike on the column of Ukrainian armored vehicles. Talking about vehicles, here's what the former advisor of the president of Ukraine had to say. Да, вот такая штука, как автомобили есть, которых не хватает в войсках. У нас же существует иллюзия, что армии не хватает F-16 и Атакамсова, так бы мы ого-го. Проблема совсем в другом, в армии не хватает элементарно. Нету автомобилей, машин нету просто, на которых... На бригаду 6 машин это за счастье, на новую какую-нибудь, да, чтобы людей перевозить. Ну, можно посчитать 2500 человек, за сколько перевезут 6 машин, когда надо выдвигаться в район. So because of this problem, we can suppose that a lot of rotations are simply done on foot like this Ukrainian squad walking in calm formation. And you can imagine the dramatic effects of such artillery strikes against units advancing exposed in open ground. 
we often hear that Ukrainians face a shortage of artillery ammunition. So how exactly do they manage to keep pushing forward? That's because Ukrainian assault units make heavy use of their mortars, which are extremely mobile and easy to camouflage in tree lines. Every assault company has its own mortar unit whose drone operators guide for fire accuracy. Ukrainians also like to use automatic grenade launchers like this MK-19 camouflaged on their net. By that moment, the Russian front saw some changes. As the 4th Brigade of the LPR and the 72nd Motorized Rifle Brigade were brought to the rear and replaced with paratrooper units. On the 6th of July, the Russian VDVs launched a major counterattack hoping to free up the besieged fortress. But every new video released by the Russians would show the Ukrainians getting wrecked, but always closer and closer. This drone footage even shows a Ukrainian vehicle destroyed inside the fort. This stronghold was really getting attacked from all sides by Ukraine. The day after, the Ukrainians unleashed an intense artillery shelling on the entire surface of this trench bastion. And here we can see the same shelling, but from the perspective of a Russian soldier from a neighboring hilltop. The fort was finally secured by Ukraine on the 11th of July, which opened the chapter for the Battle of Klitschivka itself. Russian airborne units literally fought an uphill battle to regain control of these heights. However, what made their job difficult was that a lot of these reinforcements got intercepted. Here you can see three Russian BMPs sent forward to help stabilize the situation somewhere near Klitschivka. This one disembarks roughly 6 infantrymen, so we can estimate a total of roughly 20 soldiers, when they suddenly got shelled by a very accurate Ukrainian artillery fire. Or like this Russian T-80 BVM that got ambushed by some man-portable anti-tank weapons while going to the front in support of a stranded unit. Like I told you earlier, the Ukrainians mastered the combination of mortar fire and drones. In this one, a reconnaissance group of the 83rd Guards Airborne Brigade pushed into the west side of Klitschivka. The moment the troops disembarked, they got engaged by enemy shells. Officially, the Russians claimed that out of the 12 soldiers involved, three got simple bullet wounds and they just brushed off this event. Perhaps it's true that three were in fact wounded, but we face a lie by omission where no fatalities were reported, when we have visual evidence of the opposite. The Russians also lost Colonel Yevgeny Vashuhin in such a platoon firefight. Reports mentioned that he was wounded while leading a unit of the Leningrad Regiment on July 14th, a new unit composed almost entirely of mobilized personnel, who was brought back to the rear and closed his eyes forever 10 days later in the hospital. Colonel Vashuhin and his men were reportedly coming to the rescue of an encircled unit of Z Storm Troopers when they got ambushed by the Ukrainians. By the 20th of July, Ukrainians retained firm control of this forest from where they could bring ammunition and reinforcements and stage direct assaults towards the urban area. This was confirmed by this video of this Ukrainian BTR. We noticed that it is exiting the fort that the Ukrainians just captured. And this also confirms that Ukraine is in control of this forest as well as the heights overlooking Klitschivka. Here's a bird eye perspective. It's a bit dark, but you can see the heights and the village down below. Things were not looking good for Russia. And some Chechen units were urgently sent inside the village to reorganize the defense. And here's the perspective of a Russian patrol walking through the main street. The only street of the settlement. After continuous bad news. Russian Telegram was cheering after this video of yet another Ukrainian T-72 destroyed, which they filmed from every possible angle. Problem is, it was geolocated 2 kilometers west of Andrivka. What happened is that as the Russians deployed more and more troops for the defense of the village, which they managed to recapture by the 27th of July, they neglected the left flank. Meanwhile, the Ukrainians pivoted the front and pushed further south, all the way to Andrivka in around one kilometer away from Kordyumivka. I'll be honest, I'm not exactly sure what the Russian plan is in this sector. If the Ukrainians captured the little settlement of Andreevka, this would essentially seal the fate of Klishivka for the Russians and essentially force the Russians back beyond this rail embankment. And if the Ukrainians continue such attacks, the Russians might have to reposition their troops 
beyond the Bakhmutka River, thus undoing roughly 8 to 9 months of Russian progress. That's all I have for you today. Let me know in the comment section what you thought of my analysis. If you're new to the channel, make sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to support my work, make sure to check out my Patreon or PayPal. The link is in the description below.